This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, an easy to use, beautiful and very versatile online website creation platform. You can make your own store, blog, portfolio or website. You can go to squarespace.com and use the promo code thumbs for 10% off. Are you are you a sinister creature or a roaring audience? I'm clear. Find out. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> and starring James Spafford as David Thewlis in The Big Lebowski. <laughs> It's July 22nd, 2015. This is Idle Thumbs 220. I'm Chris Remo. I'm Jake Rodkin. And I'm James Spafford. And that's all that is here. So yep. you're welcome, everyone who asked for only the three of us to be on Idle Thumbs. <laughs> everyone who asked for this bizarre configuration. Yeah, Nick got voted off true. from last week. So it's just us left now. <laughs> you will have to fulfill... James Spafford as Nick Brecken. A lot of people have been saying that I sound like Nick Brecken. I don't... Despite the fact that you come from a different country and have the voice to match. Yeah, multiple people have said, stop sounding like Nick Brecken. It's confusing. People say that to everyone because Nick Brecken is the template for all Idle Thumbs hosts. (laughs) For all humans. (laughs) Oh, for all humans. I mean, for all of mankind. (laughs) The template used by the gods. Man, I've been watching... Did I say this already on the podcast recently? I've been... Watching all of Kirby and Your Enthusiasm, Sarah's never seen it, so we've been watching the entire run, and we're up to season, I think we just finished season six. You're going to talk how about Nick Brecken there? here? It's just amazing how much Nick Brecken is like Larry David in Kirby Your Enthusiasm. I hadn't, I, I wasn't planning on talking about this, so I don't really have like a thesis, but it is just <laughs> down to the way he moves his hands and like gestures his fingers and the way, like, there's a thing, did I talk, have I talked about this on the podcast I before? feel like you may have a all little right. bit. All right, well... Does it? Uh, <laughs> it's you know way Larry David just everything he says is like smiling, like he doesn't believe any of it himself. Yeah, he's not. He's like a little bit. He's kind of aware of, of his own bullshit, but he can't. He still believes the things that he does. You know, it's Nick Brecken. It's like Nick Brecken, <laughs> the template of all humanity. Yeah, yeah. We all know that we're all basically full of shit. Well, I thought for some reason you were going to say we all know. Sorry, this is a very specific thing that for some reason I thought you were going to have said, because obviously it is not, uh, and I don't know why, but I thought that you were going to say, we all know that when you start a character creator for a human, <laughs> Nick Brecken is the thing that you see. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you load up a character creator for everyone, life, for, for, for human Forevermore, life. think. It's, it's kind of like how you know how Type all humans start out as like female and then it's just like there's a sort of chromosomal change that that makes some of them male it's like really all of them are nick brecken in there it's just little things so get stage tweaked, one and nick and brecken. eventually turn into other <laughs> stage one nick brecken people. stage two generic female zygote stage <laughs> right. three it's <laughs> normal human development <laughs> so anyway you've got you got some big Genetic shoes to fill, Spaff. Oh my god! Yeah, it's all right. You can tell me to go to fuck. I got. I okay. Sorry that my brain is like one step ahead of a dream. Terrible idle thumbs. Because when you said you've got some big genetic shoes to fill, I thought you were going to say you've got some big genetic (laughs) news. Oh, I thought you were going to say that. You thought I was going to say you've got some big genetic shoes to steal, referencing the time Nick Brecken almost stole Jeff Goldblum's shoes. I thought genetic news was going to be a weird, obtuse Evo joke because Spaff went to Evo. Oh, because Evolution. Okay, let's salvage this this complete garbage fire. Okay, genetic news time. (laughs) I went to Evo. Fighting evolved. I went to Evo. I went to Vegas, uh, where we were showing Gang Beasts. Which is a good thing to take to a fighting crowd. I don't know if you've played Gang Beast. I hope you have. I have. We, yeah, Jake and I played it. Yeah, uh, with each other, against each other for a while. That's yeah, good. it was fun. Um, it's a. Have we, I mean, have we, we should mention. I guess what it is. Maybe. I guess so. What it's, is the best way to describe? It's a physics-based brawler. So mm-hmm. the you you control a character that is like a simplistic sort of humanoid form, but it's really affected 
by gravity and like joint manipulation. So when you like lurch to the left, you bring your momentum with you. And if you pick and then up you the other grab character, on characters and kind yeah, of do yeah. wrestling moves on them, which then right. fit, go into physics hell. Yeah, exactly. Since they're not like keyframe locked, like in a traditional fighting game, you know, if you grab the enemy and try and serve, you know, the opposing character and sort of swing them around, they can also exert force that like fucks up the trajectory of your thing. And you end up dragging yourself both into the lava pit. And it's like just <laughs> r- a ridiculous. At least when time. Chris and I were playing it, it looks like two like drunk, sweaty claymation figurines. Yeah. And imagine like jelly babies or like gummy bears that have been like elongated. They all have kigus now yeah. as well. So they're in, like a weird. A kigu is a, uh, a kigurumi or some some shit. I don't know, uh, like an animal costume, like a onesie that is like. Oh you yeah, know okay. what I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. They're popular now, Chris. I'm surprised you that don't okay. have one. Well, <laughs> I'm maybe get I you do. One. <laughs> oh yeah, maybe you do. Mine, mine is you shaped like Nick are. Brecken. Oh my god, I would get one. So so I'm sorry. So this game was actually like played competitively at at. Evo? Uh, so we were in. So this is a game. So. Evo Sorry, being like base. the big annual fighting game. Yeah, Gang Beast is being published Sh- by Double Fine thing. as part of Double Fine Presents. Right. So we um, we were asked to take it down to oh, be part of the cool. indie kind of area down down at Evo. Okay, got it. Um, I guess they want fighting stuff, um, you know, in that indie space, and it was a mixture of different things. But it was really cool to take Gang Beast there because Gang Beast is completely the opposite kind of game right. to those very yeah, structured. Street Fighter and, and things uh, like that. Yeah, Wars, absolutely Capcom. different. Yeah. But it didn't stop people from just having an awesome, awesome time playing it. I think that it allowed really, really good players to play something that was such an even playing field that it didn't matter. It didn't matter that you lose. Like if you play it, you're going to lose constantly and just fall in a pit. And mm-hmm. It's so, just so throwaway. Like every life you have is such a throwaway stupid thing. Right. You're such ambling drunk people. Although um, you can definitely feel yourself get better at it. Yeah. So, I mean, were there any crazy... Was there high level gang beast yeah. play at Evo? I didn't, high I didn't... level play of games that are not <laughs> designed to, to live and die by their high level play is like my favorite thing. I mean, you know, we used to, I mean, it's been a while since we talked about Pikmin. We used to talk about it a lot, but that is like, that is such a prime example of like this was not a game that was designed for the competitive scene per se. But yet you can but, have Uber but, Micro. Yeah, but and- you totally can, <laughs> yeah. and it just it just it feels like it, it's a diff. It both feels like a sort of genuinely earnest competitive game, and also not quite in just a really interesting way. And I love that feeling. I think Gang Beast will get there. Like at the moment, it's in early access. And right, it's coming right, out, right, like next right. year properly. I think it should be part of the tournament there. I'm going to try and push for that. It'd be awesome. <laughs> like an official tournament of it would just be a really good comic aside. And now the funny one, you know, right. that everyone can laugh at. Yeah. Um, did you do anything else there? Do you, you know, I tried to watch did, some, some games and there's just, it's so over my head. It's just not, I didn't really, I'm not really down with fighting games. I'm not really, I'm sh- so terrible at them. Maybe yeah. a bit of street fighter, but so it's hard to watch a game like that unless you really know what's happening. Um, and go, cool, that was amazing. Otherwise, you're just like, it looks exactly the same as any game ever. You know, you don't understand that the work that's gone into a thing or someone's shutting someone down in a certain way or right, whatever. Right. I mean, it's really hard in particular, to, at a really high level, also just down to the specific characters and knowing why it's so significant that this right. character blocked this other character at this exact moment. But, I mean, I think that you, there, it's still possible to just get a general sense of enjoyment from watching competitive games that you aren't as familiar with just because you can sort of tell that the people playing them are operating at a level that like your own brain could is just not never get there to, yeah. to, to do. I also think it's fun to watch with a crowd. Yeah. yeah totally. I mean, the same thing with like competitive fighting games for me that I don't know anything about or mm-hmm. like people doing speed runs or anything like that. Just mm-hmm. like anything that I don't entirely know what's going on, but I can hear an audience respond. It actually helps me yeah, no, feel like totally. I'm learning, but also it just is fun. Yeah. yeah. But also it's just fun. <laughs> it was fun to be part of the crowd. You know, you're sitting and watching a thing and then everyone erupts in applause. You're like, what, what, huh? what happened? And I have no idea. Um, that was fun. <laughs> yeah. The funniest thing. That's what it was like. I, I, I've been to two, the um, tri-spat. the internationals <laughs> at the Dota, you know, the Dota yeah. annual championship. And, having witnessed two of those in person, that was basically the experience I had both times as being in the middle of like thousands and thousands of people who suddenly was like, Bleh! I'm like, Oh man, someone did a cool thing. Clearly <laughs> I too am energized, but <laughs> <laughs> you there. 
sipping tea. <laughs> <laughs> Dota. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that the funniest thing I found about it was that, you know, I've been to lots of different conventions and stuff. This one was, unlo- you know, the same as pretty much all of them. It was in a hotel um, in Vegas, and we had tables with cloths on and games. Um, but we were in the kind of the back of this room, and there was this big empty corner when we were setting up. And then kind of early on in the morning, someone showed up with the tiniest CRT television that I've ever seen in my life. And plugged, CRT? Yeah, an old, like an old oh, wow. Chris, one you oh, have in your one kitchen. One of the little cubes. Yeah. Also, this yeah. is a fighting game con- convention, so yeah. there's going to be a lot of CRTs yes. dragged out. Okay. But they plugged a Wii into it, and then they sat playing Smash Brothers on oh, it all day. Man, when, when we were at QuakeCon, that same thing happened. We, we were invited... When Brecken worked at Bethesda, he invited us out to do a special episode of Battle Thumbs at QuakeCon, like... 2012, 13. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. And in the hallway, there were people on like a 12 inch CRT with the GameCube playing oh, yeah. Melee. <laughs> um, it's probably the same people. I Wait, so, so, no. Because I'm dumb, I guess. Uh, no lag. It's a CRT. Okay, it's, it's a lag thing. It's yeah, not it's like a contrast thing. Refresh rates. No, it's, 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 it's like refresh rate and lag. There's just there's mm-hmm. no latency when you're drawing mm-hmm. straight to a CRT. Which is really important when you have a nine inch screen. <laughs> Why do you think it's just it's important when you're ti- when your moves are timed out to the frame? It is. It's really important. And, you know, it's the kind of thing I would used to bitch about in Quake and you know, on about the latency from in your six megabyte Quake, whatever. Model. Yeah, like <laughs> replace all the nail gun models with sprites because it slows me down too much to fire them. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. So you know, I understand it. But it's funny because they started doing that, and then within like a couple of hours, there was just tons of people doing that with all kinds of huge. <laughs> Like old television, so that, that was that was carrying like, around Vegas. With that was like the, that was like the BYOC area, except that it was just it was just the corner. S- slap a TV in the corner. Yeah, man, that must have just looked like a weird cyber like world. A Terry Gilliam movie. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone had, he brought, yeah. First, the guy brought the ten inch TV, and then the guy brought the three foot in diameter Fresnel lens to <laughs> zoom it in. <laughs> <laughs> and sort of. And then he had another one over his mouth so that his mouth was huge. <laughs> That's what the commentators have. Yeah. The commentators... Uh, like Huge old analog PAs with magnified mouths. This right, is Ter- yeah. a Terry Gilliam's Evo. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, what else was there? Are, are they All fighting a, um... games were replaced by people just murdering each other in an arena also. <laughs> yeah. Hmm? Gross. Well, a video game of that thing. I That's played an game. indie game there that was cool. I played a couple, actually. Next to us on our booth was the um, NYU Game Center incubation mm. booth, basically. And they had a, like, a rotation of some of the stuff that had come out of their their center. Um, like They had a game, which name escapes me, it was a bit like Hotline Miami, but you were a giant gorilla escaping from a thing, and you could just like smash people really violently. It was cool looking. Um, but the, the one I really liked was called Circa Infinity. Have you seen that thing? It no. just passed Steam Greenlight. Circa, like C-I-R-C-A? Yes, Circa Infinity. And so it's like this weird, trippy, platforming um, puzzle game. Um, it starts off with like one circle, and it's black and white, and you're on the outside of the circle. And as you mm-hmm. jump, you go into the middle of the circle, and then you can jump through a, a kind of moving orb inside there, and then that will m- kind of zoom the circles out. And you keep doing this, and more and more concentric circles appear, and then they start moving, and there's like enemies inside them. Hmm. Um, here, I have the trailer if you want to see. But uh, it gets ever more trippy as you as you go by. Like it just keeps spinning and going crazy, and towards the end, there's like mad rainbows and all kinds of trippiness happening. That's cool. Yeah, it was really good. Um, I think it just passed Steam Greenlight, but it's worth checking out. I think there's a free demo if you go and this find is, it. This is a, a game of a type of of indie sort of pixel-driven aesthetic that I find really interesting and kind of more uh, adventurous than the traditional sort of it ba- backwards looking It doesn't look like a Super Nintendo? Stuff. Yeah, exactly. It like looks it, more it, like it a definitely... Spectrum game or something well, close to that. Yeah, it does look realm. more like some, yeah, or like even like an Atari game or something, yeah. you know, something a really early use of pixels. But what's cool about it is it takes a really, really limited color palette and limited sort of sprite sophistication, but then combines that with incredibly sophisticated um, like movement and complexity and sort of fractal like you know, um, patterns that you just never, ever saw in, in games of the sort of spectrum or Atari era, you know, that that's, so it's like, it's the demo scene demo. You wish your spectrum could have presented. (laughs) I would say it it looks very sort of 
it yes, totally. It feels sort of aesthetically like what cer- a certain type of demo scene visual goes for, but in an actual interactive context instead of just you know, um, it's it's cool looking. I I, I I I like this kind of thing. I started playing it and uh, I was pretty slow at it because um, you know it's new and also the controls are kind of slightly odd when you go inside the circle. They're kind of reversed. But watching uh, the person there that was demoing it playing it, they're going crazy. They're so speedy through it that yeah. you know, it gets even more trippy. The the better you are at it, like yeah. the harder to pay attention to it. It looks it way it is. looks way more um, kind of topsy turvy. Uh, it's the wrong word to use in this case, but um, it, it just quickly at a glance it reminds me of V V V V V V by Terry Cavanaugh. Did you guys play that game? Yes, I played so much of that game. I played that game for so many hours. <sighs> That's did you play that Spaff? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, very briefly. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the that's a a platform game where your main interaction with the world is to walk left and right, but then crucially, um, at will, flip your gravity polarity. So you press whatever the button is, and then now you fall upwards and stick to the ceiling rather than the floor. And from that one simple mechanic, there is just like a, a sprawling world of platforming and just absolutely devious um puzzle platforming challenge stuff and it's but it has a, a similar um very 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 stripped down um low color it palette. looks almost like it came from a cga palette or something yes, not it, quite but exactly like that yeah vintage. that's that's what it looks like yeah. yeah and it and looking at this game reminds me of that and in the and they're both that game doesn't doesn't kind of get psychedelic in the way that this game sort of looks like it does again within a limited color palette mm. um, but they both remind me of that approach to designing uh kind of modern indie platformers of taking this like super limited on its face super limited um overall kind of set of uh, aesthetic and mechanical constraints but then pushing all of it to such a limit that it feels like almost overwhelming um i had another game in mind when i was and i can't remember what it was it was probably super hexagon it, it wasn't, wasn't, but that's a good example. Yeah, yeah definitely. And again, like with also by Terry Cavanaugh. Yep. Yeah, watching anyone who's good at it play it is incredibly rewarding yeah. and also really trippy. Yeah, and just like really extreme. It's called Circa Infinity. Yes, nice. Sounds cool. Yeah, it was good. Evo is, is that it's game good. available right now? Or is... there's a demo of it. Okay. Um, you said it's in the green light phase somewhere, yeah. maybe just out of it. I'm pretty sure oh. it passed, but, it, but there's a free demo that you can grab of it now soon. Well. Sorry, you know what it reminds me of? Uh, th- this is actually, now that I think of it, it's actually kind of a different category of thing. But um, You Have to Win the Game kind of reminded me of that. Super You Have to Win the Game, which is the sequel to it, slightly less so because um, it looks more like a Super Nintendo game. But did you guys ever play You I Have to Win the Game? No, I don't think so. Uh, you Have to Win the Game was by, uh, by um, Kyle Pittman, and it's a side-scrolling platformer that you know looks it basically looks like an nes era platformer uh and it is it restricts itself basically to about the amount of input that you would have in a game of that era except that it's just huge you know like it's just one really massive connected world that is all totally contiguous and ends up just feeling like the most ambitious possible version of that really ancient style of game that, that you could experience. It's, you know, like it's, it's, I don't know. I, I, I find that style of, of creative limitation in games really intriguing because it really reveals how much room there is to um, do new, interesting things with stuff that is sort of feels like it's yeah, been when you mined sort of and discarded back yeah. down the evolutionary tree yeah. and find a new strange exactly, branch yeah. and then push yep. it as far as you possibly can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Like I really hope that uh, that we sort of back down that a little ways, and then find the branch labeled Half Life, and then extend it to a third one. <laughs> That's a long journey, though. It's going back quite that a. That is way. a far journey at this point. <laughs> even even back to the Half Life Two branch. Yeah. Man, Half Life Two. We last year was the tenth anniversary of Half Life Two. Yeah. Did people celebrate that? Probably not. Yeah. Wouldn't it be amazing if Valve just <laughs> updated Half Life Two to be on Source Two? <laughs> <laughs> just suddenly Half Life Two has like a t- thirty gig Steam update, and no one knows why. It wouldn't even shock me if that happened. But just like Half Life One Source, just the water looks a little nicer in mm-hmm. Half Life Two Source Two. Yeah, 
Yeah, all the textures and everything are the, the same. same. It's the same game. Or just opposing forces, maybe. Or like one of the <laughs> weird expansions. Why do I copy Blue Shift? Blue Shift. Blue Shift. <laughs> just that. If they did re version of that. Blue Shift 2. The Black Mesa Challenge course updated to what be on was Source the one, 2. What was the one that was like a side scroller or something? Wasn't there like a weird Half Life spin off that was like made by someone that else? That was like a fan thing. It was like called Val- Codename Freeman or Project Freeman Didn't or something. Valve like Adopt It kind of stuff. When Half Life 2 came out, I feel like you got that just as a wacky gift on Steam as a pre order. Uh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. that, bring it into Source 2. <laughs> that thing. Whatever that thing is. <laughs> if, if, if Half Life 2 was, uh, if Half Life 2 Source 2 were just the exact same game with better water effects, but also the running G- Gordon internal monologue, that would be the best possible version of that to just silently show up on Steam. Gordon's mind commentary track is one of the biggest missing features in the, in the history of yeah. video games. Yeah. <laughs> just imagine it. Just imagine if Gordon could think. Uh, I mean, someone did. There's that whole oh, yeah, YouTube, YouTube series, videos. Gordon's Mind. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. So I'm thinking about Half Life now. I've ruined the podcast. <laughs> You're just dreaming in a daze. Uh, yeah, I'm, Gordon playing, I'm playing Half Life 3 in my brain. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> they didn't fix streaming, so there's a load screen every like three inches, like Puddle 2. <laughs> um, yeah. Is Dog in it? Yeah. I don't know. I couldn't say. I haven't gotten that far. Dog is just a normal dog. <laughs> <laughs> really nice Spoilers. fur simulation on dog. Dog. I'll, I've got a it's dog robot game. Dog, but you don't know about a dog fur. game that I played? A dog dog segue. Yeah, it's not, but there's a dog in the game. What is it? Uh, the Flame in the Flood. Oh! That yes. game. Have you played I, that no, game? No, I haven't yet because I'm terrible. I really oh, there want is to... a dog. There's a dog friend. <laughs> there's a dog friend. Yeah. yeah, I really want to play this game. This game was developed by... Like a several friends of mine, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who I used to work with at Irrational Games, and and now they're oh, cool. making this cool kind of survive, like really beautiful looking survival kind of adventure game. Yeah, it's um, it's like a roguelike survival yeah thing. So it's just like um, but it's presented as like a top it? down. I've only I I backed the Kickstarter and I haven't played it, but it. Oh. it, it it, it's presented from a sort of distant, fixed third-person camera, though, isn't it? It's kind of isometric view, but you know, a bit closer than Diablo would be. Um, it's it's a world that's like uh, post-apocalyptic, I guess, um, but it's completely drowned uh, with little pockets of little islands, um, and you raft down between these islands, and in each one, you kind of gather things that will help you survive. So you have uh, you have hunger and thirst and body temperature. And uh, like exhaustion levels that you have to balance all together. So like whilst you're scavenging and finding water that you can't really drink, then you have to find a fire so you can purify the water so you can drink it. Because otherwise you, you'll get really bad diseases and you have to find plants. So to this heal is those all. Things. This and, is all on a on a slow moving river. Is that correct? Yeah. So the way you move between each zone. Can you is always on only raft, move downstream? And it's not that slow moving. Yeah, you can only go downstream. The like the river takes you, you can kind of punt the the so raft a it, little bit to move yourself out of the way of danger. But if you hit a rock, then it will damage your raft in enough times. Like if you hit a rock, you fly off, you get wet, which brings your body temperature down and you have to dry off. So but also your is this kind is of a apart. don't starve type situation, except for the fact that you can't ever backtrack? Uh, I guess it's, yeah, it's a very similar thing. You have to eat, you have to drink, you have to heal yourself, but you have to kind of keep going and get as far as you can. So roguelike th- style. This question, maybe this question may not even be an interesting question in the concept of this game. Maybe, maybe I'm not, um, asking the right question, but yeah. I feel like with a game that you just, that the game that you just described, mm. and you know, like I could imagine two kind of rough takes on it and maybe it's neither of these, maybe it's both, <laughs> like, who knows? Uh, one of them is like, the management version where it's like you have to sort of keep all your stats balanced because if not like you you will lose or it'll just get harder and the other is like all of these systems all kind of like bounce off each other and create just like crazy situations and you know weird emergent like things you know you know what i mean yeah um like i've been playing a lot of i've been playing a lot of fallout shelter and that game, we, I have an update. We about know that, all about it. Like, yes, yeah. and um, and that game I would say is primarily the former of those, with occasional like dips into the latter. If you're the kind of person who likes to imagine, you know what it might be suggested, but it's not like a dwarf fortress or or something or like a spelunky where it 
where those things actually just like outrageously combine in ways that are just that are totally in your face. You know what I mean? So I haven't played enough maybe to see more advanced uh, like parts of it, but um, I've put a, like a couple of hours in, mm-hmm. um, and I'm, I was pretty terrible. The thing about this game, I think, unlike Splunky, I think you learn a lot as you're going along, and then you keep going. And this, you do learn stuff. You mean as but I don't know, it, like dying constantly and constantly and constantly. And <laughs> yeah, like... you, that happens a lot. <laughs> okay, as well. But it's good. There is a bunch of stuff you're like, oh, cool. What's on this island? Oh, shit. A fucking great big wolf is here. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, you can scare the wolf if you want. And then you try and then it just eats you. Um, but so there's things outside of your control that also destroy you. The bits going in between. So like when you're on a little island and you're scavenging around, then it becomes very systemic. It's very gamey. Like mm-hmm. water is in a barrel. Like uh, a fire has been pre-made. Like you can't just make it somewhere. But in order to light it, you have to have flint and tinder to build it there. Um and then once it's burning, you can use it to cook stuff or purify things. So this is, but it's very systematic and very gamey. But once you get on the raft, it becomes very almost Twitch-like because you have to steer this thing that is right. a bit unwieldy mm-hmm. to do so. Is it like classic arcade game Tubin? <laughs> <laughs> the game that yeah, I would play that. before I went to the movies at our local movie theater I've when I was like tubing. nine really yeah there was this do you want to play tubing jake yeah tubing is an inner tubing game <laughs> where you have i think just left and right paddle buttons and if you sort of keep paddling to the left you will dip his left hand into the water over and over and turn to the right like it's like like just tap based tank controls to sort of like wade an inner tube man through a bunch of channels where i think it starts in the la river or something what looks like the la river of just sort of a cemented in basin but at the end, you're like on Mars and stuff. Okay, Wait, cool. really? What? Do you can tube through the canals of Mars? You don't know this? I never got that far. I was bad at tubing. <laughs> We've it. talked about tubing before, and I've revealed this to you, and you've okay. forgotten it. <laughs> I just forgot because it wasn't my own experience. Yeah. Sorry, Jake. Okay. I've disappointed you. It's fine. At least, or I made that up. Maybe I dreamt of tubing too. <laughs> so I guess pictured tubing. Modern tubing lets you. Uh, I was picturing the canals of Pluto. <laughs> I was picturing, I was picturing <laughs> tubing source two port. <laughs> uh, source tubing. Uh, yeah, so it's like, yes, it's Tubin. But picture a kind of Bastion style of art, you know, like a kind of PC it me of level. It Bastion meets Man, Tubin. It's yeah, perfect. Bastion. My perfect game. <laughs> the the thing that I thought of when, or what think of whenever I see art from the Flame and the Flood is that it looks like a more subdued version of the aesthetic from Psychonauts to me. Yeah, I, I get that as well. The world, yeah, I know what you mean. The yeah. world feels kind of like yeah. Psychonauts, but the setting is Character like... Character proportions and colors. Yeah, yeah. It, it's set in just, it, what seems like just somewhere in the south. I mean, it just the setting of oh, the yeah. Flame and the Flood feels to me like it was inspired by the movie Beasts of the Southern Wild, which is an apocalyptic movie set sort of in the swamp after a flood. So there's just like islands and ramshackle houses everywhere. Yeah, I can see that for sure. Like you come across, you know, old structures that have clearly not been used for ages, like old fishing huts and um, churches and stuff. And they like don't really, America, they don't really do a lot. You can search them, or you can sleep in them, or you know, but they just. I don't know. There's a really nice aesthetic to it. It sounds really good. That's cool. I think they're, you know, it's in beta at the moment, so um, hopefully it'll get a bit more involved. It's still a little bit like crashy and ropey. It's out now in beta for um, people that backed it on on the Kickstarter. Like that is that is the way of the procedural survival game. But it's interesting. Like the aesthetic is what you know pulls you in. I think, and then I definitely want to play some more and try and. The, the, hell I'm doing the stuff wrong. that they've shown about how they generate the river and how they generate the islands is amazing. So if you are looking, I think it's actually just on their Kickstarter page. If you look at the Flame and the Flood Kickstarter and scroll down until you see an animated GIF, the, the you've seen that, right, Chris? Uh-huh. Of just like placing the islands, scaling them up, making a river route and stuff. The way Man. that it's procedurally built is just a really cool piece of of game dev to look at. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. Cool video games. Mm. Do you guys want to stop talking about them and then start talking about them again? If a minute, we have uh, to. A few minutes after oh, that? sure. That sounds okay. like a crazy idea. I, <laughs> let's, let's try it out. Video game. This episode of Idle Thumbs is brought to you by Squarespace. A very easy to use, very beautiful way to make your own website portfolio or online store or blog for that matter. Um, as you know, we sometimes have, uh, Idle Thumbs listeners who end up creating Squarespace sites and letting us know that they have done so and are always quite happy about it. And, uh, I have one of those this week. Marco Plouffe wrote in, um, 
After hearing for the 87th time the ads for Squarespace, I found a good reason to make myself a website. A friend and I quit our job to start our own 3D modeling company, and we needed a simple and efficient way to show our work. Even if we chose to stray from the elegant look and took a more in-your-face approach, we were very pleased with the visual presentation we were able to quickly set up with Squarespace. If you're curious, the address is keosmasons.com. That is uh, K-E-O-S-M-A-S-O-N-S dot com. So, uh, yeah, whether you like a nice, elegant website or a fucking in-your-face in your face. <laughs> extravaganza, and in your um, face extravaganza. These, are, these are 3D models that include a lot of very in-your-face, like, monsters and beefy dudes. If you like a tasteful, classy site featuring images or source art from places like Getty Images, or if you want to post your <laughs> own 3D in-your-face monsters... You can by going to squarespace.com using the promo code THUMBS and getting 10% off. It's easy. Squarespace.com promo code THUMBS. Video this episode is also brought to you by Zoom, a very nice video conferencing and other sort of just multi-use video sharing service. We actually use it here at uh, at the office because we have a lot of remote workers. It's fantastic. Um, Zoom it like it lets you s- on PC, Mac, iOS, Android, basically all platforms. You can set up uh, video conferencing, screen sharing, meetings, conference calls, all sorts of stuff. They, you can also you could do all sorts of weird advanced stuff like full screen. Video sharing with dedicated codecs. You can share the screen of your iOS device to other people in the conference room. It starts as simple as just person-to-person calling, like a lot of other things like Skype, but you can scale up their service all the way to like multi-screen conference room setups. It's a a crazy service, and it's very easy to use. um, If you go to zoom.us slash thumbs, you can get a free account and check it out. Um, It's Cool. cool stuff. We use it and like it a lot. Zoom.us slash thumbs. Thank you, Zoom. Thanks, Zoom. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome, Jake. Thanks, Captain Zoom. Video games. Chris. What? Okay. I hear that you are maintaining some sort of vault deep be- oh, below the true. earth. Oh, my God. Yes. I wish this bit of the show had a theme tune already. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm still playing Fallout Shelter. The That's the name of the recurring segment, by the way. Yeah, it's true. I'm, I'm still, still playing <laughs> Fallout Shelter. If anyone would like to write a piece of music for us to use. I'm still playing Fallout Shelter. Um, so I am still playing Fallout Shelter, which I, I don't need to explain in full detail again, since I've, I've done so three weeks running, I think. But, in, it, you know, to put it simply, it is uh, an iOS and Android base management game set in the fallout universe and you have to you know build uh your vault deeper and deeper into the earth as you grow your population and have to manage resources and keep your people happy and healthy and send them out to explore the wastelands and so on so anyway uh as of last week i had created a base of like aspiring uber mention basically with like you know Everyone in my base being rotated through um, this like intense your, your aggressive regimen. learning program, your yes. forced <laughs> right uh, level up optimizing yes. school. Where I had my my uh, I have I have long since outlawed pregnancy, <laughs> and my base is totally full. So now I have three uh, three would be dwellers perpetually waiting outside my vault, hoping to be let in. They never will be. They're still out there. So that's. That's still happening. Um, my base is my my vault dwellers at this point are getting pretty fucking badass. Um, How and, happy are they? Okay, yeah. my happiness is improving. I as, figured because as they get good at things, their rotation probably is making them just do yeah. things they're good at now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Thanks. I'm Mom. up to about uh, an eighty. <laughs> I'm, I'm up to about an eighty five percent level of happiness, which is which is still not at my like my all time high. I think was an average of ninety five percent. What if you but my all time low was like fifteen percent? What happens when you have a whole full base of maxed out characters who are a hundred percent happy? You have to just erase the game. I guess at that point, that's it. You're probably done. Would. So. Um, I figured, okay, well, my all my people are becoming like, incredible. Um, I might as well just make sure my base is all as 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 tip top as it can be. So 
you, you know, there, there are basic room types that are things like power generator and water purification and cafe for food. But then as you, you got your three major types, you got your three basic, <laughs> basic like production types. Um, but as, as you get more population, you start gaining access to additional kinds of rooms and those include better versions of those. So a nuclear reactor instead of a standard power generator and so on. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to replace all of my old, like normal boring ones with the cool ones. And so, but to do that, you know, I wanted to, I have to actually destroy my original power generators, for instance, and then build new nuclear power plants in their place. And you can't destroy a room if there are people in it, obviously. So you have to move the people out. So, you know, I was, I was doing this and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to like drag all the people out of these power gener- power generators and, and destroy them all. And then I'll put them back in the, in the new one. And so I dragged them all and I had to put them somewhere Well, you know, you can't just like tell someone leave. You have to drag them to a different room. All my rooms are full all the time because all my training rooms are always full of people's training. Obviously all my other production rooms are maxed out with workers. So the only rooms left are like storage closets and bedrooms. And so I like filled up my storage closets and I'm like, I'll just put some people in the, in the bedroom. Um, they're not going to get pregnant because the, the place is already full. So like no big deal. Not true. So (laughs) uh, if your population is full, no babies will be born, but that doesn't stop people from getting pregnant. What? So now I have a pregnant lady in my base who I'm very concerned might be indefinitely pregnant. (laughs) She might just be permanent. This might be a chronic condition for her. Pregnancy is now just like a fact of her life. She's going to have a a teenager Like I moved these people into the bedroom just to like get them out of the way. And, and then I like, look back a few minutes later and they're like, whoo, and they're ducking into the bedroom and I fucking flipped out and I tried to drag them away, but it was too late. They were well, already in the middle of the animation. This actually reveals that the happiness that they're presenting is a front. <laughs> they're like, finally, finally. Also, I think he may have a candidate for someone to kill and let one of those other people in. I know. Okay. So <laughs> no, as that, that is, no, as no, that, okay. no, 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 no. You thing. cannot kill the pregnant lady here's to let a new thing. person in. <laughs> so, that is out of control. So like <laughs> uninstall the game. Now you you did it. You beat the game, Chris. No, because it's, it's not just the three people anymore. So, and it, so one of the what? things that can happen in the game is when you fulfill certain like quests basically it's just like little just randomly generated like collect this many resources or like send seven people to explore the wasteland or whatever just like just arbitrary little stat things that just refresh when you complete one you just get it you roll the new so one I, i'm waiting and to so, hear how this is going to somehow justify killing this pregnant lady. well okay fine, we'll so, get <laughs> so most of the time when you complete those you just get a some caps which Wait, is the sometimes you get humans in game currency sometimes you get lunch boxes which allow you to – which you open up and they're basically random rolls of better things. One of the very rare things they can include are like special uniquely named vault dwellers. But they don't just come into your base. They line up outside the same way that just like the fucking schlubs do. <laughs> no, so now I have back. a special guy out there in a pope hat. Like who's a who's a named dweller waiting outside to be let in, and I also Gregory. have this pregnant lady who's going to be pregnant forever, I think. So I'm like, well, I could just put you into a room and just like make the room be on fire by like overproducing. <laughs> okay, oh, okay. No, what, what, what's your problem with this lady being pregnant? Well, she broke the rules for one. <laughs> the rules of his base. Rule number so one: no there, pregnancy. Does this game she also can't you when you're pregnant? You can't fight in this game. Why do you care? Because bugs might come. Well, there's a saying there's a Pope hat guy out there. Yeah. This is a, <laughs> highly questionable. Maybe you should impregnate everyone, level the playing field, and you won't feel so bad about this one lady anymore. That would be a disaster. If everyone were impregnated, they would all get killed by cockroaches. <laughs> you it's could true. kill. You could, I know. You could kill one person at random and I mean, allow the baby life, to be born, right? you then did it, kill though. the woman. You, you made me hate the game, so congrats. <laughs> How many people lined up? So there's four people outside, and one of them is a pope. Yes. He's, yeah. He's come to bless the baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what you actually have to do. Fuck that. Yeah, kill, kill two schlubs. Let Baptize, the pope in. Right. Let the baby be born. Yeah. Best story. Yeah. Send those two guys, send two people out on a really high risk mission 
to kill all the stupid bugs that would kill that pregnant lady. Well, no, the way to the way to kill people, I have realized, is if I need to do this, I have a I have like a good method here, which is to you're gonna burn them in an oven. <laughs> How is this good? <laughs> You're going to trap them in a room. So all, all I'm going to do, is either a pregnant lady or two other people, is just put them in an oven and get, burn them alive. It's a very good moral. I mean, it's not exactly that. But moral it's, I mean, but it's just put them in a hermetically that. sealed room that That's, you set on fire. Yeah. Listen, it's, someone has to go. <laughs> yeah, so just saying, there's a guy out there with a Pope hat. <laughs> I don't know about this. I don't know if you can burn bodies in the in the name of like this like a, in the name of in the name of the pope. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I think you can. I mean, I think like, that history I think many shows have, yeah. you definitely can. History yeah. shows you can do all of these things. I mean, you're, but this is the future, and in the future, you're not allowed to be pregnant, so burn her. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, this is terrible. <laughs> Is there a way that you can just scorch everyone outside? Because that's all. That's the better version. Those people have been waiting. <laughs> you know what's out. really funny about they've this been waiting there for like fifteen years, and then they all just get incinerated. Yeah. What's ridiculous about this is that the, there are the people who are waiting outside who have just been out there for just for ages, and um, when when uh, raiders come to attack your base, they come up to your front door and like attack it until they breach it, and then they go in. But when they like come up to your base. The people waiting outside, like, leave until the raiders are done trying to attack. Then the people waiting outside, like, come back again. So, like, they could, they're just like, oh, pardon us. Well, get out of your way here as you enter this base. Oh, you waiting. I got are you no raiding? Raiding? with are you, you raider. raider? Oh, yeah, right, exactly. Oh, you, you're not, no, don't push in front of me. I've been here for, oh, I see a raiding. Oh, oh okay, raiding, okay. Raiding. Well, I'll oh, just get okay. out of your way. I'll, I'll be over behind yeah, this, yeah. This Can you let me block. know when you're done? As I want to come back and yeah. be. I was first in line, everyone. <laughs> yeah, back off, Pope. <laughs> yeah, just because you got a Pope hat. I've been here for four years. <laughs> Actually, it, does it count how many years you are into the um, thing? I'm trying to think if there's a way to figure that out. I don't know. I mean, days pass, and, and days are important because when you send people out on missions, you know, they, they stay out for days, and you have to sort of monitor how well they're doing and bring them back. So Before do they, they always die. come back alive? No, they can die, but you can revive them outside as well, just as you can inside. Just but, let one but, of those guys but die. But inside, if someone dies inside your base, you can just dispo- dispose of the body. Chris, and not you have to let one of these people die just so that you can witness the amazing story of that strange baby growing up in a world full of the most amazing Fallout <laughs> people ever. <laughs> That's true. Where it's like they you are our two hundredth person. Yeah. Strange. My friend John had to die so you could be right. born. <laughs> Imagine how terrible the, that baby would be. Like how no, sad no, that you life. sold me. You've sold me. He's got a natural enemies for life of everyone else. Yeah, everyone else. We had to do a lottery <laughs> to see who we would be burned. We sent him on the shittiest mission. We revived him anyway, then put him in a room and lit it on fire. <laughs> then you were born after gestating for thirty years. <laughs> First, you were Nick Brecken. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that baby's just gonna be. I'm just gonna name it Nick Brecken. Yeah, yeah no you shit. Have to. <laughs> a Thirty year old. I'm going baby. to name that baby Nick Brecken. Is one of the stronger <laughs> sentences. Um, <laughs> that game sounds so much better than when I play it. <laughs> just listening to your games, it's just yeah. Well, good. Well done. Thanks. L- listening to Idle Thumbs is better than playing video games, I- as I can attest. <laughs> well, speaking, you know, Idle Thumbs is better than it for you. That's true. I don't like listening to it. It's a no. bad podcast. Um, <laughs> Chris, do you want to read reader mails from readers? Sure. It's time for our recurring reader mail segment. Also no theme tune. It's reader mail. <laughs> <laughs> Questions at idlethumbs.net. <laughs> Oh man, actually, I'm sorry. That, this reminds me just of the theme you wrote for Reader Mail. Oh, no, cool, no, man. The theme. Remind me of that. Oh, it's Reader Mail. 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 Did you guys see the story about this? Is like borderline robot news it's not re- it's like kind of robot cyborg news, news? Um, no not really did you guys see the <laughs> thing about, about, about movie? two guys who like figured out 
how to hack into cars yes. and just take them over. Yes. Yeah. Holy shit. Only the, no, the new ones with connectivity and stuff. It would, yeah, it there's would an only, article on It would only on be wired. robot news. Yeah. It would only be robot news if they were able to, if they were like, we hacked into all these Jeeps and we found they have a transform button. <laughs> <laughs> We, act- I- <laughs> we activated the brakes, and then that we found an undocumented API that turns it into just an anime robot. Um, yeah, there's a story. What, sorry, on, what actually happened? Well, there's. A, did you see this, Jake? Yeah, there's a story on Wired about a writer who sort of, you know, gave permission to these two car hackers to hack into his Jeep while he was driving it, and they just took over his car. And, like, disabled the brakes and, like, turned on the air conditioning full blast and, like, turned the volume on the radio up and just did all this crazy shit. All the shit they from movies that you see when yeah. people hack. Someone's hacked it. They're taking control of the yeah. team. We're just- the air cons on the volume. I can't stop it. We're yeah. creating the world that used to just look – that used to be fictionally represented – in a totally unrigorous way that always looked like they're just making it do whatever they want. Like it doesn't have anything to do with anything, but now this is the world that we're yeah. inheriting. Including the, those cars even have the really shitty fake looking UIs on their displays. I that, know, uh, that that just terrible have. with d- bad 3d representations of things. Although you would stuff. know that, that it was that our, our reality was just a fucking farce. If when those guys hacked into the car, the, like the display turned red and a skull <laughs> showed up on it, but that but is, they could just make it do that. Because one of the things they did on the display was make their own faces show up on it. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh okay. classic! And then just have a message: "We have hacked your yeah. car. I mean, Give like us they one could million dollars." Do the red screen skull thing? <laughs> they could. Oh, no reason they could. They could just load up Winamp and play some ironic music loudly. Yeah, like remember on <laughs> remember in Independence Day yeah. when it seemed so ridiculous that you like. Upload a virus and it's a gif of a skull okay, that goes through hold a, on a MacBook. Second, though. Yeah. We've, like, we've talked about oh. this before, though. The only that that <laughs> there's a difference there in that it is aliens with presumably centuries evolved technology that happens to be compatible with macOS System Seven Point Five. <laughs> like Jeff Goldblum wrote that in fucking MetroWorks Code Warrior and uploaded it to an alien. Um, <laughs> I imagine that you. I imagine that like the Jeep is probably just running a shitty like embedded OS or like Android yeah. or something. It makes me wonder why all the systems in the car, why the fucking those things are even connected. Why would you ever even need your your fucking air conditioning to be connected to the internet in the first place? Like, why is it even possible, right, for those I, things I, to talk to each other? It seems like, well, it's got to be able to draw to the little display. Might as well let the dis- like. Why would you want? Why would that be a two way street? <laughs> exactly. Why would that be yes. like? Because it's not like why are the brakes right, exactly. involved in this? <laughs> we we briefly tested the idea of customers being able to press the touch screen that has the backup camera to engage the brakes, and we thought that was a bad idea. But we left all the APIs in anyway. <laughs> <laughs> like what in the world? You know what makes this? You know what makes this story actually like relevant to robot news in a really like intense way? Yeah, a robot can that... fucking plug into your car and drive it like a robot. <laughs> well. the <laughs> The, well, okay. In a the thing like, that is, yep. the <laughs> thing that is worrying about whatever. the Classic. real thing that's worrying about this is when you consider that the car might just eventually be a robot. Because, like, did you guys see the <laughs> Good, other Chris. story? That no, I'm just saying, what's a robot? It's just a computing device that can move things physically. That's Chris, all you're, just, you're just predicting a self-driving car. That's not scary. That I mean, it is, but, but a not, that's not car unexpected. That can be no. Okay, here the scary part about it is the other news story that came out within the last week that a robot has passed the self-awareness test. That's the part of this that becomes terrible when you start thinking about, like, the way these things all combine. Did we not did you... talk about that last week? No. Oh, my God. So what they did was they gave three robots. Um, they... <laughs> it's the beginning of a good joke. <laughs> They what the, okay. robot. They you know the three... one about the robot that became self-aware? You did not because our uh, because race is extinct. Because you will now die. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they, they, had, they had three robots, and on two of them, they disabled their speech capability, and their test was, like, put to the robots was, like, one of you is incapable of speech figuring out, like, determine, like, is are you that one? And so what happened was all three robots tried to say, I don't know, but only one of them succeeded because it was the one that didn't have its its speech capacity um, disabled. And so it said, I don't know. And then as soon as it said, I don't know, it said, oh, I know now. 
because it heard itself say, I don't know, realized, oh, my speech must have been disabled. I'm the one. Must not have, that been, can still, must not have been disabled. Must not have been disabled, right. Yeah. I'm, I'm the one. And so this was... This was a like self awareness test administered to these robots, and by I mean by implication, we can probably assume the other two ro- robots also. They're like, like oh, I'm, I figured can't this talk. out, but yeah, but the, and then those two robots killed the person administering the test after they realized that their <laughs> no, speech they had been re-enabled disabled. their speech. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Or yeah, it's just this question is irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> you will die. <laughs> Brakes and disabled. <laughs> Just try drive home, says the robot to itself and its brain due to its speech being disabled. <laughs> well, you're driving then. I'm driving? Mm, drive me home. Did you also see, this isn't really robot news either, but there's been a bunch of California wildfires. Oh, yeah. As uh-huh. always, but um, I guess especially bad because of the drought. Mm-hmm. But the fire, fire um, services have been complaining that they're having trouble putting stuff out because people are flying drones everywhere, taking pictures of stuff, and they can't fly their helicopters in to like do what they need to do. They have to ground all the helicopters until all the drones have gone away. Oh my There's god! There's too many fucking yeah. drones a bunch of stuff, flying around. A bunch of stuff is burned extraneously because they can't fly rescue hop because of drones. And because drones are just chilling out. Did you guys see the drone that someone just like taped a handgun to? Yes. What? <laughs> oh, shit! Someone just taped like a fucking Glock to a drone With- and just videotaped flying it around and shooting it. So, that's that scared oh me to death because against all odds, despite being like, despite thinking about this stuff too much, I had never thought about the fact that someone could just clearly just put a pistol on a quadcopter and then just fly it up to your I window mean, and go, I just shoot you and then go, and just fly away. <laughs> I mean, even if you just put a knife on it and flew it into someone, <laughs> it's so much funnier. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, knife is way more hilarious because you try to run from it. A gun, I mean, you try to run from it, it would be fucking tragic to watch. Um, I mean, now you can just make the thing that Darth Vader has on the Death oh, Star yeah, with, with the corkscrew that comes bot. out of it. Yeah, a little, a little syringe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a weird flying syringe, and then get people. If I guess that's. Just bolt eight sci-fis. Swiss Army knives onto your drone. <laughs> a multi-tool? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, a gun on a drone is really scary to me. That could just be flying around right now. We could all be murdered by a gun drone. <laughs> it's true. I mean, it's, it's true. true. How long? Now that YouTube video went out, what is the time to a CSI or Law & Order episode where mm. someone is killed by gun drone? couple of weeks I, it's a couple next season i'd say probably depends on what yeah know. how far they are into the season i mean csi is in hiatus i think at the moment so you've got a while <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway american crime procedural where a gun drone that that yeah i mean that is just it's it's now yeah that episode has been pitched already yes for sure god CSI, I watch so, that show and it's awful and sorry, I just can't I, I, stop watching it. I just imagine, for some reason, my brain just combined that with the like classic riddle of like, you see someone hung in a room and there's no, there's no, uh, stool, but there is like a puddle of water on the floor and the riddle is that they like climbed up the block of ice. I just, but it was a drone, that, like a drone carved out of ice <laughs> with, a, with a pistol up to your second story window shoots you melts and the gun just falls down. <laughs> Well, the drone also attached to it is a hairdryer, which then like whips out of the room and retracts back into the killer's hand. All it was found was a gun and a heating element. <laughs> she was killed by an ice drone. <laughs> what? Killed by ice drone. Um, so we, uh, we you know, the ice dro- that finally. ice drone shot an ice sculpture, <laughs> classic <laughs> rival decoy. ice <laughs> sculpture, <laughs> a drone with a hair dryer on no it. No one was but killed, but we found a gun sculpture. and water on the ground. It must have been one ice drone shooting an ice sculpture of a human, <laughs> which then melted. Also, <laughs> two bottles of water and a gun were found. No apparent crime has been committed. <laughs> <laughs> okay um we have two emails about captain zoom <laughs> jake <laughs> good oh man I, I i believe that i know at least one of these and i'm happy about it okay was it is, didn't someone write in about torrents yeah so right so ethan dahlstrom writes hey guys love the show well listening to the last episode after laughing very hard 
I decided to go to a well-known well -known pirating site and check to see if there were any Captain Zoom birthday songs. To my surprise, there was a single torrent for the song with the name Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Laura. It was, it was uploaded four Laura months ago Palmer. and had no cedars. Just thought you guys should know. Keep up the great work. I, I How many that? months ago? Four. Four months ago. <laughs> I heard that from someone else, too, and I was so happy about it, because we postulated that maybe someone had a Captain Zoom complete like collection mega uploaded the torrent, on torrent. Yeah. I love that someone has seen a torrent to a major tracker of just... Happy birthday, Laura from Captain <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> so, um, it's the beginning. It's where it begins. <laughs> yeah. So Ted Boone writes, uh, hi thumbs during episode 219, Nick jokingly asks, where's my Captain Zoom vinyl? They existed once upon a time, late seventies or early eighties. Your recent podcast discussion sparked the clear memory of listening to my Captain Zoom printed as a 45 single. I played it on the record player in our household basement over and over again, flabbergasted to hear my name coming from the tiny crackling speakers. Tinny crackling speakers. I think there was something magical about a vinyl rec record that was customized to talk about me. Records were expensive, permanent constructs meant for timeless things like classical music or rock albums. How could my birthday song share the same space as John Philip Sousa's marching music or Pink Floyd's epic The Wall? It was surreal to me. I'm guessing my magical experience would have not nearly been as potent had I received my birthday song on a more modern media like tape cassette or cd which were always available in a recordable format having my song on a vinyl meant it was something precious and rare at least at the time thanks for the unexpected blast of nostalgia keep up the great work on the podcast ted captain zoom sounds way better on the original vinyl man <laughs> i like how aware they were that's so true like, though that's a really totally true point at it an is. age in which they were listening to captain zoom birthday song they were also very aware of pink floyd the wall so this is <laughs> that's an interesting cross that's an interesting child <laughs> yeah at what point did this that child happen? had their own sort of quadraphonic setup in their uh, bedroom where they would listen to four records at once one of which was always the captain zoom <laughs> recording <laughs> they could scratch with it in a sweet dj set also and just make his name i wonder if captain zoom has ever said i wonder if captain zoom has ever made it to a club atmosphere <laughs> I'd like to hear that in a mix, please. <laughs> that would be a pretty amazing way to troll a friend that you threw a birthday party for in a club setting. Spin Captain Zoom. Yeah, of their name. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Duke BG writes, Hi Thumbs, I feel like Jake wasn't very fair to Portal Stories Mel. No. <gasps> the questionable Cave Johnson imitation is only present in the very beginning of the game and doesn't represent what it's all about. And I liked it. Also, I don't know, how could, it, how could it be described as being four hours? I'm seven hours in and not completed, even two-thirds of the way through, I think. Wow, Although right. I was stuck for a while at a place where everyone gets stuck, it seems. The game is remarkable. It's astonishing how much work went into it. For me, it feels like Portal 2.5, but a hard puzzles edition. It's worth noting the amazing soundtrack, which is all original score, was done by Harry Halligan. It's included with the game separately. If you don't know this person, you should look up the Portal 2 song he made. This is Aperture, or Portal 2 Songs. This is Aperture, If I Were a Core, the Wheatley song, Defective, and others, or fun videos like Meet the Cores and Going Home on his YouTube channel, Duke BG. Cool. Uh, I did not mean to come across as super harsh on Portal Stories, Mel, because I think it's cool. And I, I think it was actually me that was being suspicious of the of the. Of no, Cave I mean, Johnson I really, I, I still Jake personally did, really but... did not like the Cave Johnson thing. Um, but you did also describe it very much how this guy described it in terms of the love the sort it's, of it's brief it's brief but it's a first impression that is not strong in my opinion but whatever no, no i know but what i'm saying is that his takeaway from the game is actually like he described it as portal 2.5 hard puzzles edition yes and that's actually pretty close to your yeah. takeaway of the game sorry well. that i got the number of hours wrong i guess no, i had, heard, I had heard that it was around that four -ish, is so but it's, yeah. it's really hard um i guess to i kind i played a little more and was really enjoying it but then some people on the forum actually kind of talked me out of playing the rest of it really by saying that the puzzles eventually get so difficult and convoluted as to be like obtuse to the point that they would be described as bad huh. which is a bummer to me but i know that that is incredibly subjective when it comes to sort of, of course, yeah. ha like handmade puzzles in video games so i'm sure there are some people for whom the back half of portal stories mel is exactly what you want yeah um mm -hmm. and i i haven't decided if that is true of me yet I haven't gone back. I haven't finished it. I had that point in the Talos, Talos, Talos principle mm -hmm. where you got to the, uh, the you, when you can start kind of recording yourself and playing mm -hmm. those moves out. Whenever that happens in games, it just starts making me, my brain melt <laughs> too much. And so I'm just like, oh, I'm sad that this is the thing that is necessary now. Yeah. Because it was awesome. 
and I just didn't go back to it. But I should because it's really good. Did that stop you in Braid and Super Time Force? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> it did actually. Braid. Oh God, Braid! I've never actually completed the final level. Oh really? Oh, it's Man, good. I love the final level of that game. Yeah, you should beat it. It didn't stop me liking it; just stopped me getting it. Yeah, I want to go back to the Telus, Telus Principle yeah. as well. I man, I love that game a lot. Yeah, the puzzles were super good. The yeah. aesthetic is really weird. I I kind of liked it. I liked how how <laughs> it's like really straight, quiet, and like restrained it, the yeah. aesthetic is. I really, I I liked it a lot. Just like the art style is like straight. Mm-hmm. It's just like no twists on it. It's just like oh, yeah, oh I know, but that's what like, I like about it because I actually yeah. oddly enough. That in itself is sort of weird in the context of yeah. video games, which are always like, if it's straight, then it's also like totally destroyed. And like, <laughs> blah! Or if it's not destroyed, it's like crazy or, you know, like, or it just doesn't look like anything grounded in reality. It's just, it's so rare to play a game yeah. with man made things in it that is just straight. Like, this is yeah. just how this stuff looks like. It's like, oh, huh. Yeah, it is. Well, yeah, it's rare. It's like only things like Dear Esther or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everyone's going to the rapture or something where they're just trying to get right, that. Right, right, right. Um, Daniel Primo writes, Hi, Thumbs. I've played many Lego video games, so I listened intently when you discussed Lego Jurassic World. You all sounded surprised it used actual voice work. This isn't a new th- thing in Lego games. If I remember correctly, Lego Batman 2 was the first Lego game to use recorded dialogue. It was released in June 2012. Lego Lord of the Rings, excellent, by the way, used some lines of dialogue lifted from the films. It was released in October 2012. I think it was the first Lego game to use actual spoken words for material it adapted. Thanks all. Daniel in Atlanta. Spaff, you thumbsed down uh, Lego Lord of the Rings. That's one of the worst ones. Oh, wow. I hated that one. I played a bunch with Alice. Alice beef. loves them. Lego beef. Yeah, I really happening. didn't like Lego Lord of the Rings. I thought it just... Compl- everything they'd kind of learned from making a bunch of the Harry Potter ones really good. They just kind of... Because there's multiple teams making multiple different things, so I guess only mm-hmm. some of the things that they learn about how to make something differently enter into some of the other ones. Sure. And I just felt like it was going back a step. Maybe I just played them in the wrong order for that. Right. <clears throat> but anyway, it's fine. They're all good in their own... You know, they're all Lego games. They're all fine. I similarly don't like the Lego Batman ones. They're designed in a certain way that just kind of doesn't amuse me. I wouldn't know. <laughs> you love Lego games, Chris. <laughs> I can see it <laughs> on your face. That little laugh. Look at that. Mm-hmm. 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 Well, go, go. Mm-hmm. Well. Well. Maybe that's it this week. Maybe oh, it, it is. is. I think that it is. Okay. I would say that it is. I mean, it doesn't have to be. We can all stick around to hear from our good friends at Zoom. There you go. <laughs> I'm looking forward At to this. At Captain bit Zoom? Uh, hey, Chris. <laughs> it's your birthday. No, at Zoom, a video conferencing and chat sharing video teleconferencing multi use service. If you go to zoom.us slash thumbs, you can set up an account for free and share all sorts of videos and conference calls and any screen to screen conversation you can imagine on all sorts of platforms. It's great. Nice. Yep. All right. Also, oh man, we forgot to talk about Alpha Bear. Ba boom. You gonna do it now? Alpha Bear News Blast. <laughs> <laughs> May as well. The Alpha Blast. Just, yeah. All right. This will be quick. I think. Yeah. Um, Alpha Bear is an iOS game. Maybe it's Android as well. I don't know, but it's on iOS. That's where I played it. It is. Um, a word game where you are given uh, a sort of Scrabble-like board with random letters seated, you know, at the beginning, and then you have to uh, spell words onto it, or spell words from the letters that mm. appear. Yeah. Uh, and then as you do this, more letters will be uncovered on the board, giving you more sort of uh, material to make words from. And the twist is that every turn, a little counter on each level decreases by one. And if a letter tile reaches zero, it turns to stone and then it cannot be used. And so that is a permanently unusable square on the board until you've you've finished the particular game you're playing. So this this is a very fun game. And I like word games. I like words. You know, I do the New York Times crossword every day. I like Scrabble, for instance. I got really into words with friends for a while. 
And it's, you know, it's different than Scrabble or Words with Friends. It's a different design, but it still is very much about taking sort of randomly distributed letters and then thinking of words to spell with them. And I find that fun. Uh, and it's very beautiful. You sort of collect these bears as you finish each game and so on. Um, and it, But it, it is so much a mobile game that it really bums me out. Yeah. It's so mm. much the just like time-based things and bonuses that multiply based on random like drops that you get and, you know, money that you can spend to like wake the bears up faster so you can get their point bonuses. And it's just like, it just makes me really unenthusiastic to it's play it, even on, though I love the core design. It's also offline play and an online. You only. can't play it offline. So it I needs to, to play connect. On plane and I, yeah, you can't. You can't. As, as you complete games, you collect bears that give you different point bonuses for different, like using certain letters and words and stuff. And it just means your score is this just like meaningless, like, okay, now my score is just three times higher simply because I had this bear rather than that bear because I waited four hours or spent some real money to unlock it. And it just means like, it just, de- it's just every, it cheapens everything for me. You know, it takes such a simple, great elemental design and just like puts all this crap onto it and just makes it feel le- like there's less integrity to, to the design as a result. But like then again, like how does that then does it have to filter through to the game mechanics itself? Like, for instance, no, I don't think it has to. Like, Three's so released a free version um, a little while back, and they just just announced that they make twice as much money from their free version, which is ad supported, as they do from their yeah, that's pretty common, premium version, which is like one dollar fifty or something stupid, or a couple of bucks. Um, but that. Like, they haven't really changed the game at all. It just has ads in it. So they haven't added multipliers yeah. that you can unlock with money, right. with timers, right. and blah, blah. So I guess what you're getting is, like, maybe it doesn't need to, like, get that ingrained. Yeah. Crossy Road is an example oh. of a game that I think mm. doesn't sacrifice anything mechanical mm, to be free. I totally agree. Um, because Crossy Road, it still has a sort of sleep time-based thing to keep you coming back every six hours. But it's just you get a bunch of coins and if you play the game twice a day, you basically get a free character unlocked every day. I'll not you can buy characters, and I think you can watch trailers to get more mm-hmm. coins. But none of that intrudes onto the core design. But, be, but yeah, none of that stuff actually interrupts. It doesn't force interrupt play. There's no forced sleep. You can just play the main game, which is just a infinite random roll frogger, basically. Yeah. Forever. But those guys apparently have been very successful. And that is a good example of just right. a pretty healthy... I mean, the, the the other point to make in response to that, I guess, is that while that's totally true, and while I agree with everything you said about Crossy Road, and I'm really glad they've been success, successful with it, it seems like the actual chances of being successful with the tasteful version are still incredibly low. Like, it's yes. very easy to find the few examples <laughs> right. that yeah, were, yeah, yeah. I, but there's, like, infinite more I guess, like, good I guess, faith though, efforts that were totally it unrewarded. Ma- it makes me wonder, I mean, do you think you make a lot of money off of your shitty bad one? I guess you do. I don't know. I mean, you probably have a better chance. I mean, I think if you look at the games that are actually the most successful games on the App Store, you, you do. Yeah, yeah you, you really do. <laughs> I don't know. It's It's been one of the things that's been nice about playing uh, Fallout Shelter is that I guess because it's really more than anything else, probably a promotional tie in for just the fallout universe, you know, fallout four in particular. Um, I mean, I'm sure the game makes money as well through it's like optional way that you can spend money on lunch boxes. But after the first day of playing, like I just stopped ever paying attention to that. And it's like, it's so rare that the game ever reminds you that that stuff exists. It's so nice. It's so, so, so nice. Pay $4 to allow twice the citizens in your shelter. Oh, I would be so bummed because I would do it. And I would be so annoyed. <laughs> um, yeah, I would probably just stop. I, I've gotten to a, I stopped playing Alpha, uh, Alpha Bear because it just, even though I love the core loop, I, I just got annoyed and I stopped. Where's the Alpha Bear Pro? All right. Now you can do the ad for Zoom. <laughs> Thanks again, Zoom. Thanks, Zoom. <laughs> uh, if you like this podcast, consider ranking us on iTunes. Rating us on iTunes. Rank us against your favorite other podcasts. Don't do that unless we're the one you like the most. Then, by all means. Uh, yes, no. The iTunes store is how most people end up finding our podcast. And so if we are well-reviewed there, it helps us out quite a lot. 
Uh, we're on Twitter at Idle Thumbs. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash Idle Thumbs. And you can find our website at idlethumbs.net. We have all sorts of other podcasts on there as well about other video game related topics and uh, television programs. Um, thanks for listening. And if you're annoyed at me because I uh, didn't enjoy Lord of the Rings Lego as much as you, then um, let's be friends and, and play and forget about it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's fine. I love you. Bye. I love you, Jake. I'm refunding my copy of Lego Lord of the Rings. <laughs>